Jesus. May all be seated. Hallelujah. Good morning, Hebron family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good to see all your smiling faces behind masks. But happy to see you all uh, in the house of the Lord. Uh, happy New Year again, because this has been a while since we've been in the sanctuary in this new year. Um, so recently I learned that an elevated heart rate and a feeling of butterflies in your stomach that you can't see, uh, and if you're sweating and if your pupils are dilated, it's similarities between being nervous or anxious and, uh, and being excited. So if you see any of that when I'm preaching today from the Word, it's because I am what? Excited. Good answer. Amen. So there is some ner uh, nervousness, but uh, the same God that um, hold, held Moses holds me as well. So before I get into the topic for today, let's start with a word of prayer. Loving Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing us, O oh Father, together to listen from the word, to worship you, O oh Father, Lord Jesus, and bring glory to your name. We thank you for bringing us together to hear from the word. We pray that you bless each one of us that we are here, that are here in the sanctuary and that are hearing us online. Pray that you uh, bless me and submit myself at your feet as well, O oh Father, that you use me as a vessel. Speak through me, O oh Lord, to your people, O oh Father, and that uh, many are touched and blessed, O oh Father, with the words that you speak through me, O oh Father. Thank you for listening to our prayer. Amen. So the topic for this morning that I have... Uh, that has been laid on my heart to be shared with you all is standing up for your faith. Standing up for your faith. And uh, I'll be sharing some of uh, some verses and thoughts uh, as I ponder through this topic. And uh, the key verse is 1 Peter 3, 15 to 17. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always bring, being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Hallelujah. All of us have been... Um, hearing of the many persecutions that are happening around the world. Uh, many have been, uh, many, many news from uh, our motherland of India and all around the world that you hear about persecution and a lot that is happening for Christians around the world, missionaries, evangelists, pastors, churches. And I believe that is one of the things that have been uh, pretty strong or pretty uh, heavy in my heart. And I, w I, I believe strongly that this is one of the reasons that I'm being led to share from, the, from this topic today. We are living in a time where our faith is questioned. What we believe in is questioned. And those of us who hold the faith are questioned as well. So it's not just the message that is being questioned, but us as mes messengers and our choice of carrying the message that is being questioned as well. And so that brings me to my topic. And it also, uh, the question for each of us is if we are growing and maturing as true Christians, to stand up for our faith during these trying times? Or are we folding? This may be in your school, so I'm not just talking to adults here, but to children, to young adults, uh, to everyone above that age as well. Uh, this may be in your school, your workplace, um, in any setting that you are uh, when you're outside. Faith. God has promised to be with us when life is hard, but often our hearts struggle to believe it. That is just our human nature. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't know that, that they'd find Jesus in the fire when they walked into the furnace. But they allowed their faith, not their fear, to guide their actions. Faith rarely makes reasonable sense, at least to those that are around us and see us, that those that of us that practice our strong faith and belief in Christ Jesus. So when people see faith in action, they need an explanation. As a result of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's faith, you all know the story here, King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God's power and people stood in awe. So when we stand up for what we believe, 
the same thing happens. In the eyes of the world, suffering is all pain. But in the eyes of God, suffering is a vehicle of hope. If you're a Christian, as it said in uh, 1 Peter 3.15, you should always be prepared to make a defense. My question for you, for us, all of us this morning, is are you prepared to make a defense? It should not matter if we are in the sanctuary or not in the sanctuary for the past five weeks. You should be prepared at all times. You should be good to defend. You should be able to defend your faith to some degree. We're all in various levels of maturity in our walk with Christ. But you should be able to defend your faith. It is a sign. It is an indicator of how you are maturing in your belief in Christ. And to get mature in our belief, we should know what we believe in why we believe it, how to share it with others, and finally, how to defend it. You need to know the first three to be able to know number four. You can't do defending without knowing why you believe in something, what you believe in, and um, learning to share it with others. Last week, you know, pastor spoke about on his topic of moving a little further about David and Goliath and him facing Goliath. And as I was uh, thinking through this topic... You know, I was thinking of how strong David's faith was. There were many people that stood there facing Goliath as Goliath was shouting out, who amongst you will come out to face me? But the faith of David and how he was strengthened by his experiences as uh, he approached that time and where he was about to face Goliath and his faith to go, uh, go forward and act in faith. You might be thinking that standing up your faith and uh, defending it involves you know, preaching in the street corners, uh, traveling as a missionary to far-off countries and being an apologist. Uh, those are all some things that, for some of us who may have not done any of that, uh, may appear as, you know, far-off things to uh, hold on to or latch on to. Or that is the picture that comes in our head when it says, when we say, stand up for your faith. But, yes, sure, all of those are a part of it, but we can all stand up for our faith wherever we are at, be it our school, be it our workplace, be it if you hang out with your families or friends um, for Thanksgiving or Christmas or any occasion when people visit you. Uh, we are all innately wired to be social beings. I don't think this is news to anyone. We're just innately you know, wired to want each other. That is why there's a lot of joy this morning as we see each other in the sanctuary and as we fellowship with each other. That is what we yearn, regardless of... Uh, in corporate America, a huge thing that's going on right now is I want to work from home, or then the companies want you all to work from the office. Regardless of you wanting to work from home or work from the office, we are all innately wired to be social beings. And all of us have this internal want to belong, which is, a great, uh, which is, which is great in a lot of scenarios, but there are also the scenarios and situations when we are around our friends in school, work, or all those other settings that I mentioned that, um, that can be challenging. There may be temptations that show up, or you're enticed to do things that are against your faith and belief when you are in a setting like that. And that uh, sense of wanting to belong to a group or clique and make the decision that they're making is stronger as the number grows larger. So if you're standing with one of your friends and talking to them, it's easy to say, hey, this is what I believe in, and this is what I'm going to do, and this is the decision I'm making. Um, if that number goes to two, yeah, it's okay. If your number goes to three, slightly more, you stand up in a congregation like this, um, you're probably e it's probably much easier to fold to what everyone else wants to stay, say. So that, my brothers and sisters, is an opportunity to stand up for your faith, for what you believe in, and for our belief in Christ, uh, when the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart and nudging you to not just go with the flow with what the others around you are doing at your work or at your home. Uh, I'm sorry, not at home, but hopefully not at the home, but when you're in a large setting. Um, it could be something as obvious as uh, someone reaching out we, are all, we all work in a place outside this place where people may ask you, hey, they think it's quite natural and normal to ask you, hey, do you want to go out for a smoke? Or do you want to go for a happy hour? Or go for drinks? Or uh, 
maybe something even further as going, you know, taking drugs or whatever. And those are probably easier for us to say no. Um, but there are also something as more venomous than that, and which are the thoughts and opinions. During these times, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people believe in a lot of things. And when we are in a large setting and group, when there are discussions, faith-based discussions, and a uh, lo lot of uh, discussions that are being said, when there is a majority agreeing with something, it's easy for us to nod ahead or agree with something and just go with the flow rather than speaking up and speaking up for what you believe in and just sticking to that and being okay to stick out for that, especially when the Holy Spirit is nudging at you. That is an opportunity for you to stand up for your faith. This is a situation and challenges, challenge that faces us today, like I said, in any age group, for kids or for adults, it is easy uh, to fall into this trap. So what I have to share from this is don't lose your identity as a Christian, as a believer of Christ. Stay firm to your belief. Moving along, the second part of that verse talks about gentleness and respect. Most times when we have discussions about the word, discussions about what we believe in and what we believe in Christ, emotion ta uh, takes, uh, we have passionate discussions, right? And it shows up in the form of emotion, shows up, shows up in the form of, um, I don't know, heated uh, or loud tones and a lot of expressions, facial expressions. That is what takes over a conversation because of our passion for the topic. But sharing the word with gentleness and respect is what this verse that we read this morning, 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16, shares about. Sharing your faith is not just about the message you share, which is very, very, very important, but how you relate to someone is equally important. Once you get out of a conversation, when you discuss your what you believe in and why you feel strongly about a topic or what, why you st feel strongly about what was shared in the discussion, why, while that is important to stick to your faith, you don't want the other person to feel degraded or uh, stripped out of their respect. You don't want them to come out of that conversation feeling much worse than they did when they uh, got into that conversation. Remember that the conversation is not about you or you um, winning that argument or that debate or that discussion or that conversation. It's about, it's an opportunity for that person to know more about Christ and to know the truth and that should never, never be something that we forget. So it should be a blessing. Our conversation uh, about these topics with our friends should be a blessing. It should be an eye-opener. It should increase their curiosity to go find more about the Word. It should not be an experience that they think back and uh, it deters them from wanting to know more about Christ or even go back to the topic because people always, you know, they may not remember your name, but they remember how you made them feel. And you don't want them to feel so bad that they don't want to get to the topic. But speak with gentleness and respect. That doesn't mean that we fold for everything. You need to be able to uh, share the word with gentleness and respect, but also be strong and firm with what we share. And being Christ-like in our presentation of the word. At the end of the day, you know, like I said, it's not about um, it's not about winning the debate, but the real reason for our defense is um, wanting that person to know more about God. If you have a poor attitude about the conversation, that is the only thing that they're going to remember from that conversation. So it's not about you winning that conversation. It is about Christ winning that soul and you remembering that. So you standing up for God begins with your own standing with Christ. So that's what I want to talk about for a couple of minutes next. In order to stand for Him, we must believe in Him. In order to stand up for Him, we should pursue personal holiness. Although we are declared righteous in God's sight, based on the righteousness of Christ, we are also called to grow in Christ experientially. We are expected as, as Christians to go through this process of what sanctification over and over and should continuously happen because standing up for him without that sanctification is hypocrisy. Romans 10, 9 to 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes and are justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. We need to believe to be justified. We need to confess with our mouth to be saved. We need to stand firm in our faith. We may say that we, may, you know, we will never be perfect until death, which is true, but it is our responsibility and privilege as a Christian to continuously grow in holiness. As it says in you know, 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16, it reads, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Are we pursuing personal holiness? Regardless, like I said earlier on, being in the sanctuary or not, it's not Sunday to Sunday. It is about what we do Sunday through Sunday. That is important. Next, standing up for Christ means loving others and doing good to them. Galatians 6.10 reads, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. This may be the reason we have uh, we used to have, I guess, pre-COVID, potluck after, after service or after church. That was just a joke. Do you, love, uh, do you love and do good to everyone, especially to those that are sitting beside you? It's not just about standing firm in your faith outside when you're having these conversations with your friends and uh, showing missionary work, or I'm sorry, doing, uh, uh, you know, evangelizing and talking to others, but do you love those that are around you because people are watching. There was an old song that I remember growing up. I believe it was written in the 60s or so. Um, they will know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they will know we are Christians by our love. What we stand up for and our faith means nothing if those that observe us and talk to us don't see that love. And that love starts amongst us as fellow brethren, as those that are in the sanctuary and those that are watching, those that are around you, it starts where you are at. It impacts our ability to stand up for Christ and minister and influence those who we share Christ's love. It does not matter if your friends are non-believers. It does not matter if they don't agree or not agree with what you think or what your decisions are. But you need to continue doing good to them. You need to be good, be kind, um, you know, be unbiased with your decision making whenever you come and you know be well mannered with them as well so it's important to love one another and that's a huge part of standing firm in your faith standing up for our faith means being also being patient and prayerful towards those who oppose him and us when i started off i had mentioned it's not just the message people today also question the messenger who has chosen to pick this message and relay this message. Um, so standing up for faith means being patient and prayerful. You know, it is our uh, privilege and honor to carry the word and uh, share our faith and word to those that are around us. Um, but it doesn't mean, and we need to be patient and prayerful. We can't just ignore people that are around us. We need to care and love just like Christ did. And in 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, it says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. We need to be patient and gentle with the message that we share. Yes, we may get into discussions, but it's not an opportunity to just impose ourselves. Be patient with what you have to share. Be prayerful. Once you are in a discussion with non-believers or with your friends while you're discussing, are you praying for them? Are you remembering them in your prayers and praying for them and encouraging them and revisiting with them? In Matthew 5, it says, His word asks us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. To stand up for Christ, we need to be patient and prayerful towards those who are against us. That is what Christ expects of us. So I'm coming to the conclusion, my conclusion. 
like the worship team can come up to the stage. I'm getting to my last point here. Standing up for your faith also includes standing in the gap for those that are around you. They're, you know, speaking specifically here to the younger generation of the audience, I know that, you know, we have a strong church, a very prayerful church that prays for a lot of needs. We've got prayer lines that happen almost throughout the week. A very prayerful church. And I want to take a moment to speak to the younger audience. Uh, during our 21 days, you know, fasting towards the end of uh, last year, it was something that Justin shared that really stuck and uh, stuck with me and struck me. You know, we rely on a lot of our uh, parents, Appertons and Amities that are here and maybe even outside this church. When so a lot of us, again, I'm speaking to the younger generation here, when we go through a tough time, when we are struggling, when we need healing, when we are about to buy, make a big purchase or start a new job or have a birthday and we rely on all our Appertons and Amities and all our uh, the older generation here has a huge sense of encouragement. It gives us a huge sense of encouragement. There is a peace that comes over, uh, over us. There is a faith that grows within us. There is a force that is around us uh, that, that feels very comforting. It is very hard to explain it. Only those that, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you that are, that are listening to me today have, has experienced that. And my question is, and this is the question that Justin mentioned, and the passion he laid on for the younger generation is, when is it that our, us as a generation of Gen Xers or Millennials or Gen Zers is going to stand up for the generations above us and below us? Our generation should rise. It must rise to uphold them and pray for them and encourage them as well. Standing firm for your faith means standing in the gap regardless of age. As much as the church is doing and all the work around you, as much as the work is going around you to reach you as a younger generation, you also need, or we also need, to move towards that and work towards that as well. It's not about just folks reaching out to us and trying to reach us. What are we waiting for? There are small steps that you can make today. For small steps that we can make today, small behavioral changes that we can make today. It's, uh, we could use our talents for the further, furthering of his kingdom here at church or around you. If it's, not that, if it's not that and along with that, are we earnestly praying? Are we yearning for the spirit in our life? Are we yearning for his presence in our life? Are we interceding for those that are around us earnestly and praying for those older and younger than us? Are we praying for our uncles and aunts and uppers and amatis? Are we praying fervently for them? A lot of you that have been in the prayer line, and you all, a lot of us are blessed to come from a lot of prayerful families. We've seen a lot of our uh, Abhijans and Amatis on their knees, crying and praying out. Are we doing that for them as well, as we think of our, our, their prayer requests and needs? If not, why not? We should be stepping up to encourage them with the word when they're struggling or feel lost. Dad, mom, papa, apacha. Amaji, how can I pray for you? How can I uplift you for your need today? That should be what is on our lips when we see them. Are we standing up for our faith today? As it goes in one of the English worship songs, if not now, then when? If not you, then who? Be bold, be brave, for you know who has you in his palms. You may feel that you may not have the maturity of the words to speak to those that are older than you, but believe me, you do. Because who is behind you is much stronger than those who you're about to speak to. You will not fall or falter. Next time you are in one of those conversations with your friends and families and you have a different opinion, stand up for your faith. That is what I want to encourage you with. It may lead to them knowing more of the word or it may appear that your choice or thought may not make sense to them. It does not matter because even though they, not, they may not recognize you, there is one above who recognizes you and your thought and your faith and why you're sticking to it. I hope these words are a blessing and encouragement, encouragement for each one of you. Let me end with a small word of prayer as well and please rise up to your feet as well for worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love on the cross and for your eternal presence, O oh Father. We thank you for dying for us on the cross, O oh Father, cleaning us of all our blemishes, O oh Father, Lord Jesus. 
We thank you for the faith and the hope that we have in you, O oh Father. Pray that we grow, mature, to stand firm in you, regardless of our age, O oh Lord Jesus. And that we continuously grow and be mature, more mature every day. We pray, I pray that each, it, it is laid on each one of our hearts, O oh Lord, to spend more time, O oh Lord, in the Word. More time conversing with you than on social media or our friends. Making you a priority over the world than, or anything around it, O oh Father. Not just our words and actions, but our thoughts as well. That it is aligned with you, O oh Father. We pray that we are enlightened by the Spirit. That we are emboldened by the Spirit. That we are led to take the actions that you expect us to take in this world. That we are missionaries, O oh Lord. That we spread your word, O oh Father, to the many, many, many that are lost, O oh Lord, in this world that is hopeless. That is hopeless. That is crying out for an answer. Lord, you are an answer. Use us as a vessel, O oh Father, Lord Jesus, to touch many, many souls today, O oh Father. Thank you for being with us and listening, in our, listening to our prayers, Lord. Be in our midst, Holy Spirit, as we worship you and exalt you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah.